Welcome back to Coins from Markets. I'm Tina Baker Taylor, and it's a pleasure to be joined today by Maneeb Ali, co founder at Stacks. Maneeb, thanks so much for joining us today. Excited to be here. It's great to have you. So, uh, DeFi has been the source of many headlines in the crypto industry over the last year, and it's really inspired quite a lot of innovation. And whilst Ethereum remains the, the platform of choice for many of the leading DeFi platforms, competition is definitely increasing with a host of other networks vying to kind of be the front runner for scalability. And ironically, Ethereum itself was the result of frustration that many developers within the early Bitcoin community felt by the limitations that Bitcoin's native scripting language placed on their ability to experiment and innovate at speed, which you know, resulted in some of the tribal divisions that we've seen since. So many Bitcoiners have still remained convinced that the Bitcoin network would ultimately be able to act as the foundation for a broader range of decentralized applications. And Maneeb, I think it's safe to say that you sit firmly in that latter camp um, and uh, have done so since you first co-founded Stacks back in 2014. So before we take a closer look at, at Stacks today, let's start with the beginning. What was your original vision for Stacks? Yeah, so I think I, I come from academia, uh, distributed systems, and my entry into crypto was more around trying to build a secure, decentralized internet infrastructure and uh, discovered blockchains, more specifically the Bitcoin blockchain, and found that to be a very elegant solution for building other types of decentralized systems on top, like things like uh, decentralized uh, domain names or public key infrastructure, uh, different types of like username systems and and and, and smart contracts and so on. So mm -hmm. I think in, in many ways, like uh, that's that's the vision that drove a lot of other projects like Ethereum and more recently some of the next generation uh, blockchains as well. But the key difference that uh, uh, kind of like our journey has is that we're firmly in the Bitcoin camp. We think that Bitcoin is the most solid foundation uh, for building uh, building smart contracts, building these decentralized systems. So um, understanding that, you know, and having gone through, you know, from 2014 to today, has there ever been anything over the years that has led you to question that belief or that decision? I definitely think that um, in, in, in many ways, like starting something new is, is easier. Like if you want to start a new blockchain, it's like you have more, you're more in control. You can, you can actually design it however you want versus trying to be, uh, trying to work with Bitcoin is in many ways harder because Bitcoin is, is durable, it's immutable, you can't really change it. But, but Bitcoin has uh, kind of like a lot of really nice properties that would be very hard to achieve as an independent system. Like it has the highest level of security, it has a very large community behind it. And, and in many ways, like the rise of Bitcoin might be a once in a lifetime type of an event. The way it started, how decentralized it is, how fairly it, it got uh, distributed in, in the beginning and so on. So I do think like there are challenges because you can't change Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. So you actually have to do the hard work of uh, basically adapting your solutions to Bitcoin. But in the end, uh, we think that that hard work is, is actually uh, going to pay off. Yeah, interesting. So let's fast forward from 2014 to today. And stemming from the idea of decentralized namespaces, your vision then brought in from the notion of decentralizing the World Wide Web itself, giving rise to stacks. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what were your key objectives and what does a decentralized web actually look like? What, what does that mean? Yeah, so I think if you, if you look at kind of like the history of the web, like let's call it in the, in the 90s or so, this like web 1.0, uh, it's very much like peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, there aren't like large companies in the middle. And then Web 2.0, uh, with the rise of you know Facebook and other other types of Web 2.0 companies, you're basically seeing a centralization uh, of the web. Uh, people are getting used to instead of like running their own computers and directly connecting to different websites or different people and chatting with them, they're all actually depending on large. Uh, service providers and their data centers. So your 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 laptops and your your, your machines are like dumb terminals, right? Like your all of your data is with the large companies, and you're heavily heavily dependent on uh, on these entities. So in mm -hmm. some ways, the de a decentralized web is like going back to the roots, uh, but this time actually guaranteeing that uh, these things can be uh, decentralized in a more fundamental manner. Like think about Bitcoin, right? Like you have your own private key. 
And as long as you keep it secure, no one can take your Bitcoin from you. So similarly, uh, these private keys can secure your usernames, they can secure your data, uh, they can secure different types of assets like NFTs or your participation in a financial, like a decentralized financial application and, and so on. So that's kind of like the, the, the original vision. But I do think that uh, it's, it's, it's much more than that as well, because it's not just about decentralizing the type of services that people have seen before. It's about completely new type of services and new type, mm -hmm. new use cases that were simply not possible before. Once you introduce this notion of like uh, ownership, like you you directly own your Bitcoin. Similarly, you can directly own your NFT or you can directly own you know some some other type of asset. It it just takes the internet to a completely different level and new types of use cases that simply weren't possible before uh, they they become possible. So you mentioned privacy and ownership. What are some of the other basic foundations that, that you've developed and what limitations did you encounter in version one? Yes, so I think um, I, would, I would divide the landscape of uh, uh, crypto into two tracks, right? One is decentralized finance and mm -hmm. the other is uh, more general purpose decentralized applications, right? So in, in the first track, you're talking about um, you know, decentralized exchanges, automated market makers, uh, your liquidity protocols and so on. And they're usually very heavily dependent on smart contracts, right? In the second track, uh, you're talking about uh, things like decentralized social networks or even, even, even NFTs in a way come from that category. And over there, uh, in addition to some support from smart contracts, you actually need a lot of other types of uh, services, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, you cannot really build a decentralized uh, social network without a decentralized storage system or without a decentralized identity system and so on. So I think our project actually started more heavily in the decentralized application space. Uh, mm -hmm. We built out all the core infrastructure needed for a decentralized identity, decentralized storage, uh, and how to register usernames and, and so on. And we were always working with, with the, with the, in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Like how do you register these things on Bitcoin? How do you scale that and so on? And interestingly, uh, we always had smart contracts on our roadmap, but you can, in, in terms of like the order of operations, we focus first on infrastructure for decentralized applications. And then with Stacks 2.0, we focus on smart contracts. And interestingly in the industry, if you look at where uh, we are seeing more traction, the order is actually reverse. Smart contracts took off first Mm -hmm. And I think the decentralized social networks and, you know, decentralized photo sharing and these types of applications, they're still down the road, right? So I think that, that, was, that, was, that was a very interesting uh, thing where uh, out of the two tracks, one of them is actually gaining market adoption first. And I think that's, that's very interesting. And we're seeing that with the rise of Ethereum because Ethereum did focus on smart contracts and that's, that's where they started. Yeah, so do you think that um, because that was, you know, prompted maybe by Ethereum trying to differentiate themselves with a the use case, but um, it does seem to be that, you know, as an industry, we, we like to see what cool things we can build. And then it almost seems like it's an afterthought around putting the right infrastructure in place to support these cool things. And you guys kind of started with the infrastructure. So does that put you in a better position to be able to kind of expand on that now? I, I do think so that, you know, if suddenly uh, decentralized social networks start picking off tomorrow, like mm -hmm. a lot of the work that we have done in scaling, uh, scaling some, of, some of these uh, systems, a lot of developer tooling that, that has already been built out, like we got more than 400 applications that people had built. It's just that I think uh, we need to realize that smart contracts have product market fit today. Whereas mm -hmm. things like decentralized social networks are still in the very early stages. Like I don't think the mass internet market is ready to drop Facebook and switch over to a, to a uh, decentralized social network right now. It doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. I think in my mind, it's just a matter of time and just a matter of sequencing that what, what happens first. And, and in terms of smart contracts, uh, we like in, in general, like our, uh, our, our DNA is to, to be very thorough uh, do the proper R&D and design systems in a, in a manner that they're secure and they're scalable. So we've been doing work on our smart contract language since 2017 or so, and it went live uh, early this year in January. So it's called Clarity. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful language. It gives you formal verifications for all of the uh, programs that you're publishing, which means that developers can actually have mathematical proofs 
uh, that mm. is is the smart contract going to do what they want it to do and so on. And it's a very, very precise type of a language and it gives uh, the developers full visibility into Bitcoin, right? So it actually uh, brings smart contracts to Bitcoin uh, in a way and then they can start interacting with Bitcoin. They can actually start, uh, Bitcoin transactions would actually trigger logic in these smart contracts, which is a, which is a very powerful thing. Mm, indeed. So you mentioned earlier, one of your core tenets has always been to leverage the, the security of the Bitcoin network. So as a layer one solution, how does Stacks specifically do that? Um, and how does the proof of transfer consensus mechanism work? Yes. So I think a lot of the design of the, the, the latest version of the Stacks blockchain, Stacks 2.0, is informed by our experience kind of like uh, building on Bitcoin in the previous years. And I think we are firmly in the camp. Like if you, if you rewind the clock a little bit, you go back to you know, 2016, 2017, it wasn't very clear that our transactions going to scale on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. Mm -hmm. like the, mm -hmm. the entire debate around big blocks, small blocks and so on. But, but over, over time, once those kind of like, you know, big block type wars settled, it was, it was abundantly clear that Bitcoin is going to become a settlement layer. You're not going to buy your cup of coffee by paying fifty dollar transaction fees on the Bitcoin network. We were we were actually registering uh, domain names on on Bitcoin in, in 2017, where a two dollar domain name would need to have a fifty dollar kind of like transaction fee attached with it. And it's clearly you know that's not scalable. Mm -hmm. And that's where you know um, that informed the design of Stacks 2.0, where we want to use Bitcoin as a settlement layer. Like that's how scalability comes because we can we can settle a thousand transactions or a million transactions in a single Bitcoin settlement transaction on the Bitcoin layer. And, and, and that design is a lot more scalable than trying to do these transactions directly, directly on Bitcoin. And then uh, we, we clearly didn't want to go off and, and build a separate network. We want to leverage not only Bitcoin's uh, uh, proof of work and the security of the network, but also the trillion dollars of capital that is already sitting there as, as Bitcoin. So the two design goals mm -hmm. were can we actually leverage the security of Bitcoin? Like basically meaning that to attack stacks, someone need, will need to attack Bitcoin, right? And that's, that's how we have designed the, the proof of transfer mechanism. It's super interesting. Like actually, if you, uh, if you take almost like, you know, proof of work and proof of, or proof of stake and try to take the best features of them, like this is what uh, proof of transfer really does. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. So what, the way uh, proof of transfer works is that instead of doing your own proof of work, you're actually kind of like looking at uh, Bitcoin that was produced to using proof of work as a proof of computation, right? So people are spending Bitcoin to settle transactions on the stack chain uh, on, on top of Bitcoin, right? So they're not actually consuming any additional energy. You're not doing any hash case calculations. So it's a, it's a very green, a solution as well. Like if you're doing a lot of transactions on stacks, or let's say that's how Bitcoin scales. Uh, so you're actually not consuming any additional energy at all. You're just reusing the work that has already been done and you're settling those transactions on Bitcoin. But, but interestingly, unlike proof of stake, it doesn't have the bootstrapping problem, right? Mm -hmm. you, because, because you're using proof of Bitcoin's proof of work, anyone can independently verify uh, that what is the correct uh, state of the blockchain. And, and you don't have that bootstrapping problem that, that you have with proof of stake. Interestingly, you also don't have this problem where people criticize proof of stake that people who would have, uh, let's say, uh, a large number of the, of, the, of the tokens of the network, they would have a lot of power on the network. Like for example, you're a large exchange or you're a large holder um, uh, in proof of stake, you're, you're, you have a more of an influence on the network consensus mechanism if you own a lot of the supply. That is not the case with proof of transfer. In proof of transfer, there, so miners is completely permissionless, completely decentralized, and your holdings of the asset has nothing to do with mining, right? So it's a, it's a more kind of like a fair uh, type of a consensus mechanism that basically leverages Bitcoin's proof of work and in many ways extends it uh, so, that, so that now you can do a lot more transactions and settlements and just extend uh, Bitcoin's uh, security. Interesting. So then how are participants incentivized and rewarded? Yeah, so the way this works is, the, the way that any mining mechanism works is that the people who are coming in, they are basically doing the work 
because of the newly minted tokens uh, okay. and, and the transaction fees and the gas fees in the block, right? So there's basically money at the table and people who are willing to uh, do the work to pick up, pick up the money uh, um, become tax miners. And tax miners actually operate on the Bitcoin blockchain. They're bidding in Bitcoin. And interestingly, I think uh, like millions of dollars of Bitcoin have already traded uh, or changed hands through our proof of transfer mechanism on the Bitcoin blockchain. I think, I think the number might be like close to 10 million or $12 million worth of Bitcoin already. Great. So you mentioned clarity earlier, Manib, um, which is your own smart contracting language. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It seems to kind of sit in the middle between um, Bitcoin scripting language and you know smart contract language on the Ethereum network. Tell us a little bit more about it and why it's why it's different or unique. Yes. So I think if you think of the smart contract languages on a spectrum. Uh, on one side is Bitcoin script, which is extremely limited on purpose, right? Like even uh, there are some opcodes that were implemented, but then disabled on purpose because you want to keep the attack surface area in Bitcoin as minimal as possible. Mm -hmm. And the other end of the extreme is what's called the Turing complete language, uh, which is what Vitalik went with, uh, with Solidity. Like the, I think they were really trying to optimize for less just enable everything, right? Like let's just let the programmers do whatever they want to do. And it, that is powerful because you know, you, you're giving a lot of power in the hands of, of the developers, but they can also hurt themselves, right? Like because mm -hmm. the, the attack surface area is very large. So if you, if you look at kind of like um, that spectrum, we want it to be at a place on the spectrum where the programming language is general and expressive enough that you can pretty much program anything that you want but it is restricted in certain ways that, you know, you can, it's easier to have formal verifications. Uh, it it kind of like protects the developers from themselves, right? Like it's like, you don't want them to hurt themselves. Uh, and so if you, if you look at uh, a, a decidable language, it is a subset of a Turing complete language. Like you're giving up kind of like some sort of expressiveness, but you're actually gaining a lot in, in security. And I think we are, we are, uh, we are striking the right balance there with, uh, with Clarity, because what that does is that it effectively, uh, there's almost like a night and day difference between a developer knowing what the program is going to do before you execute it, right? So right now in, in Solidity and in, in Ethereum, uh, there's a gas estimate. It's an estimate because you don't know exactly what the program is going to do and how much gas is going to get consumed, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, imagine these programs have hundreds of millions of, or maybe even billions of dollars on it. And programmers aren't even sure how exactly the program is going to execute. Whereas in the, in the other world, in the decidable world, you know precisely what the program can do, what it cannot do, even before running it. And I think that's, a, that's almost like a superpower uh, for developers. Actually, just, uh, just yesterday, uh, Algorand announced support for Clarity language as well in, in their blockchain. So they're, they're taking Clarity uh, because, because of its features like decidability and predictability and implementing it in the Algorand blockchain. So the difference of running Clarity uh, in Stacks versus running Clarity in Algorand is that when you run Clarity in Stacks, you get access to Bitcoin, right? Because of the way our blockchain is designed. So you, you have access to Bitcoin state and so on, but Clarity as a language is useful even in other blockchains as, as Algorand is, is implementing it as well. Interesting. Um, another core principle that you seem to have had from the beginning has been around the end user experience and abstraction, much of the complexity that can often be a barrier to entry. And people have been developing a broad range of apps on the network for some time now. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, what's happening in terms of traction and adoption? So for example, how many applications exist today? Uh, and maybe what specifically is version 2.0 of the network opened up that wasn't there previously? Yes, so I think the biggest difference between uh, 2.0 and 1.0 is 2.0 brings smart contracts uh, to the system. Right, and, and 2.0 is, is, is kind of like our main design. That's the thing that we, we uh, have been working towards and really excited that it's live now. 1.0 in comparison to 2.0 was fairly limited and it was mostly focused on these decentralized uh, social networks type application or decentralized privacy 
uh, type applications. And I think at, at its peak, we got more than 400 applications built on top. And I think the best way to think about that is it's like, you know, if you use Evernote, instead of using Evernote, you can use a privacy uh, uh, note taking application instead of kind of like using a uh, Trello like uh, to do a tra task manager, you can use a privacy focused decentralized task manager and so on. So I think they're very kind of like privacy focused type application and at, it, at its peak, we had more than 400 applications. And now with smart contracts on Stacks 2.0, a lot of the interest is in developing DeFi for Bitcoin or NFTs for Bitcoin in addition to the type of applications that we are seeing uh, before. And I think over there, uh, there are protocols like uh, uh, you know, automated market makers or new types of stable coins that settle on Bitcoin or can use use Bitcoin collateral and so on. Uh, Bitcoin lending applications. So a lot of the latest result, and it's not surprising that you know our community has been waiting for smart contracts for a long time, and now that the smart contracts are available, a lot of the attention is actually now going to uh, DeFi and, and so on. Very true. So what does it take for someone to start uh, building? on stacks and do the app developers themselves get rewarded in some way? And if so, how? Yes, so I think the best way is to go to uh, you know, stacks.co. There's a doc site and uh, I think learning Clarity would be the first step because Clarity is the main uh, smart contract language. And a lot, of the, a lot of the other infrastructure that we had in 1.0 is getting re-implemented in Clarity as well because it's, now that Clarity is, is there, uh, you know, you can just implement it, let's say a decentralized uh, domain name system in Clarity itself and, and mm -hmm. run it on, on the Stacks blockchain. So I think learning Clarity is definitely uh, the best way to do it. Uh, in terms of like any incentives, there's an independent Stacks uh, foundation that has around 100 million Stacks at today's price, that's north of $100 million. And they're really focused on enabling developers. They give out grants to developers. There's also an independent uh, Stacks accelerator that I'm very excited about. Uh, it's run by Trevor, who's the author of the Lean Enterprise book, uh, uh, and is really focused on kind of enabling small teams to find product market fit early on. And I mm. think in, in crypto, like, uh, you know, a, a lot of these projects, they basically have big war chests and they tend to throw a lot of money at, at, at building applications. Like, that's not really how uh, you find product market fit. Sometimes product market fit comes from just a handful of uh, close team members who are constrained by resources and they're really trying to build something that people actually want. And I think the Stacks Accelerator is really modeled after that. That how do we enable people to iterate very quickly in finding real product market fit with the applications and the smart contracts that they're building instead of basically kind of like throwing money at the problem. Yeah, indeed. So with the recent network upgrade and the new consensus mechanism, you know, fully operational, um, your role as an organization seems to have changed a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're kind of focused on now and what is on the Stacks roadmap? Yes, so I think we, um, our project is also uh, unique in this way that we took compliance and regulations very seriously as well. Uh, so we're the project that had the first ever SEC qualified token offering that was very, it was like public, transparent, anybody could participate in it, including, including US people. And then we went through a very explicit decentralization process. I think a lot of the projects, they kind of like, you know, operate in this gray area or in the shadows, like, you know, you, you aren't like fully sure how centralized or decentralized the project is. Mm -hmm. And we kind of like took the problem head on, worked with the regulators, came up with the explicit decentralization mechanism where my company early on was building a lot of the core protocols, a lot of the public infrastructure. And then, you know, it was like hands off uh, when Stacks 2.0 was launching. It was truly launched by independent miners. Uh, my company now focuses on building developer tools on the network, but we have reached a stage where, you know, even if like this one company disappears, the network can easily survive because it's, it's so decentralized. And there's so many other entities and independent players who are, who are working there. So I focus, a lot on uh, developer tools. I'm a computer scientist at heart, so I, I get pretty excited uh, by new types of challenges. Like I think I'm working on some potential future improvements uh, to the network that again, I don't have the power to, to kind of like just make those changes, but I can write proposals and, and, and kind of like share them in the community and then see how the miners and the other entities kind of like react to it. 
Well, that's very in line with the Bitcoin community. So that, that seems to be uh, the best approach. Um, so just thinking about some of the changes that we've seen in the Bitcoin community, what's your view on the Taproot network upgrade? Um, do you think it'll happen? What possibilities might it open for DeFi and, and potentially other applications if it's adopted? Uh, I'm, I'm a big supporter of Taproot. I am very confident that I think it's going to get adopted. Uh, I think that in the latest numbers, maybe uh, north of like 94% uh, of signaling was in support of Taproot. Uh, I think mm -hmm. Taproot makes a bunch of things uh, much easier. Like for example, the size of, of certain transactions can be reduced. Uh, the amount of uh, information that you know some transactions might leak uh, can be reduced so it can help with privacy. But in general, my view on Bitcoin remains the same, that Bitcoin, you can have like, you know, incremental improvements to Bitcoin, but you're not going to do something drastically different with Bitcoin, which is a feature. And it's a feature that I really appreciate that Bitcoin is durable. Uh, like it's not going to go through something crazy, like, hey, let's throw away the consensus mechanism and let's just shift to something completely different or let's just completely change the token economics or, or drastic changes are not going to happen at the Bitcoin there. And I think that's, that's fine. It's a feature. You want sovereign money to be durable. And I think, I think that's great. So I think that route is like one such incremental feature. It makes certain things easier, but mm -hmm. it doesn't really give you uh, like full smart contracts, like the ones that people are used to on Ethereum or Avalanche or Solana and these new types of uh, uh, blockchains. So, but that doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't have that. It's really like, I think this is a big misunderstanding people have that because Bitcoin doesn't have full smart contracts at the base layer, Bitcoin cannot have smart contracts. Like that's not true mm -hmm. at all. Like you, you have systems like Stacks that connect to Bitcoin and bring smart contracts to it. Or you have systems like RSK uh, that do merge mining with Bitcoin and actually have two way pegs with Bitcoin and can bring smart contracts to it. So it's, it's a little bit like a, instead of having a single layer solution where you're trying to jam too, too many features into the same layer and actually opening yourself to all sorts of kind of like security uh, problems. Uh, it's a two layer solution. The base layer is simple and then you can just add another layer uh, that can be more experimental that can have smart contracts and, uh, and so on. Yeah. Um, over the past week, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, it, it seems that we in the Bitcoin community are going through this broken record uh, debate or argument again around um, energy and, you know, Bitcoin's use of it. Um, is this something that is worth kind of getting sucked into? And is this something that affects or, or the, the idea of energy consumption? D does it affect how you guys make design choices? So for example, is, is, is proof of transfer um, in, in response to, to trying to minimize energy consumption? Or do you think it's just a non-issue? No, I think, I think it's an important debate, especially given how much attention it it tends to get from, from yeah. people like obviously you know people uh, people people who kind of like you know don't like bitcoin for whatever reason or want their own own product to succeed instead of bitcoin they're going to point finger at that right so it's it's important to raise awareness and education about what 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 this issue really is and i i think i wouldn't go too much into how uh, you know a lot of miners actually use uh, more environmental friendly energy sources and so on i think i I would actually focus more on, uh, people should ask the question that, let's say you're spending electricity, uh, you're getting something, you're getting a benefit uh, by mm -hmm. spending that electricity. So if someone comes in and claims that, hey, we are not spending this electricity, like what is the trade-off? What is the benefit that they're not getting? And I think that is the thing that most people don't realize. Right. Like when you see people who say, hey, we have a green blockchain, it has no energy footprint. The answer is what type of trade-offs, the question is that what type of trade-offs are you making? And are those trade-offs the right fit for sovereign money? And, yeah. and, and, and very quickly you would realize that the kind of trade-offs that they're making is that that system might be much more centralized or you cannot independently verify the correct version of the blockchain, which is a, which is a, which is a, showstopper, right? Like if you actually cannot boot up a new node and independently verify what is the correct history or some uh, a handful of folks can actually present a million different versions of a blockchain to you uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an attack, 
like then that's not really a good system to base the entire world's uh, like monetary supply on, right? Like you need right. you need this thing to be uh, you need this thing to be truly sovereign and truly independently verifiable. And and then uh, there are systems like Lightning, there are systems like Stacks that can actually scale transactions on top. So the base layer, you're you're spending some electricity and you're gaining a valuable benefit from it. And then it's not the case that hey, every time you do a single Bitcoin transaction, you're boiling the oceans. No, you can have scalable transactions in terms of lightning channels. You can have scalable transactions in terms of micro blocks on stacks and they do settlements on Bitcoin. Uh, and that's how you get more green scalability and transactions with a very, very secure base there. And I think that's a point that is often often missed in these energy debates where people mm -hmm. often don't ask the question that, you know, what what type of trade-offs are being made when people say that, hey, our, our, our solution is more green? Yes, well, I, I think we'll probably continue to have this conversation and uh, it seems to vacillate between, you know, it's a, it's a feature or a bug, right? The energy consumption and how much of it is actually uh, being consumed. But I, I agree with you. Uh, for what it's worth anyway. Um, and it, it was so great to have you. Thanks so much for coming on and uh, giving us an update on Stacks. And for me personally, it's been refreshing, especially this week, to have a conversation about Bitcoin that isn't related to the price. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. See you next time.